At this very moment, Britannia burns. So, um, this is Spoonie, and I'm here with Richard Garriott, and we're here to talk about Shroud of the Avatar, his new game, uh, and I'm here because I, they met their Kickstarter goal. Uh, I, I was met as one of the highest Kickstarter goals, because I'm, I'm worth it. Worth and, every penny. In fact, we wouldn't be here if they hadn't put my name on the Kickstarter. You must admit this. No, well, it has to be true. I mean, uh, you know, as a fanboy myself uh, of the Spoonie experiment and, and all things Spoonie, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, we, we, we try to put at those high level goals, the things that uh, we're fans of ourselves, we know that our fans are fans of as well, and I, I gotta admit it, yes. See, and it, it's only right that they involve me in this, because I'm the guy who by far knows way more. In this room, I'm the guy who knows way more about Ultima than anyone else. But um, so yeah, uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, when it comes to this series, Richard, what made you want to start making good games again? Oh yeah, well uh, you know it's 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 been a while since I've made one of those good games apparently. Right. And uh, so uh, you know I thought if I you know if I want to continue to be successful in this business, a good game would be a better idea than a bad game. Now, oh, but you're coming back and you've got this uh, you've got this brand new game. Um, tell us briefly. Uh, what Shroud of the Avatar is like and how it differs from previous games that you've made. Well, well for me, Shroud of the Avatar is sort of getting back to my roots in an important way. Um, you know, as you are well aware, as the person who knows more about Ultima than anyone, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, while Ultimas are mostly remembered as a medieval fantasy, some of the very earliest Ultimas actually did have some sci-fi in them, but they... A they few! A few, a little some tidbits. Uh, but uh, in recent years, uh, almost really for the last decade, I've gone off to um, you know to do things that weren't traditional medieval fantasy, and I so for me, I'm excited to get back into medieval fantasy. I'm trying to rectify a few of the ways that I think uh, role playing games have gone astray. I think they've become too hand holding with uh, uh, menu based conversations and quest logs and arrows on maps. Uh, and so I'm trying to bring role playing back into it as opposed to just uh, uh, min-maxing combat systems. So basically you're calling most people who play RPGs uh, little girls. Well, there's definitely, uh, yeah, there's, there's been, you can, you can, you can play, roll out of modern role playing games without being a role player these days. Because, so. yeah, I mean, yeah, because you're old school and, <laughs> yeah. you know, because, I mean, I can relate to this because most days people, you know, Third edition D and D, fourth edition D and D. They don't know what it was like. They don't know back what it was like back in the day. You know, you know, back in the day, you rolled three d six in order for yeah. your stats. And you didn't like it. That was tough cookies. You lived with it. You lived with it, and you died with it. But did you? Did you bitch and moan? No, you didn't. You, you know, didn't. my first polyhedral dice, uh, which sadly I don't have right here in front of me. My mother made for me out of pottery. <laughs> That's you couldn't even go buy plastic polyhedral die. It's OG. I made a pottery. That's OG, right there. So like, no, it's because now you got now you got forty six drop low. You even know what this is? No, you roll, you roll, you roll four six sided dice. You drop the lowest one. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then hilarious. you assign them any way you want. Oh, that's hilarious. This is so lame. I agree. No, no, no. Then you got these quest markers floating around. You don't even people don't even read the flavor text on these quests anymore. Why should you? Why should you? You're just following a marker, right? And so, literally, the thing I the, the thing I find you know to be the quintessential example is yeah, you just sort of ignore it. You either literally don't pay attention at all as you click, or you at least glance at it to make sure I'm not going to do something that's going to insult the guys that will attack me. But otherwise, you just click through it all until it's done, and then you it's highlighted in your quest log. You click on the one you want to do now, mm -hmm. and then you follow the arrow on the map, and then you mine the level one monsters if I'm level one until I can do it for level two until level three. And that level grind is completely mind numbing mm -hmm. to me. So there's lots of beautiful art. I think a lot of, you know, by the way, I'm not, there's tons of really great role playing games these days, so I'm not knocking them uh, broadly. But I think that there's a suite of features that have been created that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, regressive. There's quest logs. In fact, there's arrows on the map, oh. auto, all this auto mapping stuff. It's just too hand holding. And I go back to, um, and we're just talking about one kind of the system. So, so for Shroud of the Avatar, we're going to go back to more typing conversation sure. style. Uh, interface, no quest log, and we're not exactly sure what we're going to do on the map to kind of help you out. But we're doing that same theorem even on things like combat. So, wait, wait, wait. 
You're telling me that I actually have to pay attention to play this game. There will be no way to succeed without paying attention. You might even have to remember a few things. Oh, God. See, uh, no, 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 see, I, <clears throat> see, I have a job. I have to... I, I, I have to, actually may have to, like, get up and do something today. And now you, you actually are making me read, and yep. you're making me, like... You, you might even have to take a note or two. No! Yeah, no! no! Yeah, I don't yeah. want to do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and while we're trying to make sure you don't have to have the reams of notebooks like you had to do in some of those early Ultimas, we're not sure people are, are, are prepared to go back quite that far. Uh, and so we'll probably give you a, uh, a, a journal of your whole history. But still, if you need to remember, why in the hell am I in this town? I know I was supposed to go see this woman in the red dress, but I forgot what I was supposed to talk to her about. It's not going to be on a quest log that's already pre-checked and ready for you to look it up. You're going to have to go look back at your own history that the game may have auto-recorded for you, but you'll have to go back and find, okay, oh yeah, I was in this other town, this person told me to go find the red dress. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to ask her about pearls, of course. And then ask her about And they go, hey lady, tell me about the pearls. Speaking of things that have been lost to history, I'm curious about certain other things that have been lost to history. Like, what happened to the fuzzies <laughs> and the, the bobbits? Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> done with them, Lord <laughs> British? Well, the, bob the Bobbits have disappeared for good reason. Um, you know, after Ultimas 1, 2, 3, uh, which were really everything I thought was cool in movies and other games, you know, so there were Balrons instead of Balrogs to not, not quite as plagiarize on Tolkien. Uh, and the Bobbits, of course, were hobbits in slightly different form. The Fuzzies, however, I actually have a soft spot in my, head, my, my heart for those Fuzzies. Uh, I still like them. In fact, I'm hoping to resurrect something similar to them here in, in Shroud of the Avatar because uh, introducing races that are internally self-consistent and uh, outside of their name, uh, you know, uh, uh, introducing uh, some, somewhere across between those fuzzies and the imps, these empathic creatures I had in a later Ultima. I saw that in, uh, in Blackgate, yeah. Uh, is I want to bring back, you know, races and creatures that have kind of evolved within our world that have rules of their existence and kind of uh, the fuzzies and the imps kind of represent that to me, so I'm going to go back to that. Yeah, because yeah, that's what I thought they might have been, was the imps, was the little <laughs> Ewok creatures who are very, very strangely enamored of honey, which required you to go into the cave of the naked people who live in the bee cave, which yeah. was one of the more obscure, arcane, eight-hour winding quests that I rather enjoyed going on about. Um, but, but by the way, those imps, the thing I liked about those imps is that if you're, I'm sure, which I'm sure you do remember because you know all things Ultima. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the fact that those imps would, would suffer based upon the death of any living things, including cellular life. Mm -hmm. And so by having them focus on or eat only things like honey and tree sap and, uh, you know, I think there are a couple other things, milk, I suppose. Uh, you know, there was little, little enough or close enough to zero life in those things, yet they're still organic and have uh, sustenance value. Mm -hmm. uh, but they would always run away if you would start killing monsters or eating apples even. That's killing enough life uh, that they are caused pain and so fled. And so, uh, you know, I like that. It was, a, it, was a, it was sort of my statement about the trials and tribulations of people trying to prove that, they, that vegetarianism is a good thing. <laughs> So, um, I'm really curious always about the, the early games, because there's so much that it, it seems like things... The, you, you've, you've tried your best to integrate the, the storyline... <laughs> I called it a storyline. No, the storyline from the early games into the older, the, the older ones. Which, um, so, I guess, I guess my big question is, you know, we started off the Akalabeth and Ultima 1, you kind of described those as almost as kind of like programming experiments, you know, they were, you know, um, so like what unique challenges did you face when finally kind of making a serious game like Ultima 2? And by challenges, I mean mushrooms. <laughs> well, uh, well, you know, here's a little bit of trivia for you about uh, the early days of the industry, by the way, um, which uh, now that I, I know that you were born about the same time that I wrote Akalabeth, yeah. Uh, you, I'm sure you don't remember these earliest days, uh, but uh, uh, but actually, you know, I lived a very sheltered existence, shall we say, uh, up until I started this in this industry. And my first publishers in Cal, which were you know all California companies, um, the the those places were truly drug laden uh, environments. My first two companies basically imploded largely <laughs> because of the. 
not just the staff's drug habits, but the the, the founders, the principals' drug habits. So I call it interesting. You yeah, interesting. You should 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 name that. That be, that aside, I actually look at Ultima, uh, Acalabeth, and Ultima's one two three. All, all three of those. You see, so you called Ultima two a serious game. I actually look at that still, and it's it was still. You know, Ultima Two was inspired by Time Bandits. Yeah, and uh, and I'm sure some more Lord of the Rings was through all of those, and D and D's and all those. But there were probably two or three other movies that I was plagiarizing out of. Uh, you know, Star Wars went into a lot into Ultima One. Homaging when you're homaging when, oh, yeah. when you're an auteur and you're stealing. It's called homage. Oh yeah, homage. Yes, I, I had a lot of homage mm -hmm. in the storylines uh, of those early Ultimas. It really wasn't until Ultima Four mm -hmm. that uh, I actually sat down and said, Bobbitts, you're out. And, uh, uh, and in fact, by the way, when they went out, so did all the elves and dwarves, and yeah. all the Tolkien stuff went away. And I said, look, I want to invite, in, in, invent an internally self-consistent game and story and world from the ground up. Second question, why do you hate uh, uh, boss monsters so much? Why do I hate boss monsters? Yeah. Oh well, so so uh, you know when you think about most boss monsters, in most games, they hang out waiting for you to come kill them. They don't do anything to be being worthy of being called a boss or a monster. Yeah. And in fact, what you usually do is run around and kill all the villagers and me and. Uh, uh, and everything else necessary to min-max your way to the top. Well, I should explain to the people at home, his games never have boss monsters in them. Like, ever. Past Ultima 2... 3, 3, 3, well... 3 there's Exodus. You never, yeah. you don't fight Exodus, you throw, you throw punch cards at him. <laughs> You're like, eat this, Exodus, go back to hell! But you don't fight, I, I don't think you fight a boss monster until, like, Ultima Guardian. Underworld 2. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's maybe true. I think I, yeah, yeah. I think that's just a henchman. <clears throat> yeah, that's, and that's yeah. not even the boss. Um, you fight the guardian, but even that's right. just kind of a puzzle. Right. And I'm not diminishing that. Well, kind of no. But um, there's there's almost never a boss you overcome through sheer force of like. Arms. Well, not as the final, but don't forget the shadow lords that are behind you there. You uh, you don't overcome them with with uh, force. Uh, well, that's true. But uh, you know, how many things in life do you overcome with force? Well, you can overcome almost anything with force. <laughs> just. But, I mean, I'll, uh, let me do it this way. Almost every other RPG, like, uh, in, in, in the world, has a final boss. It has a demon at the mm -hmm. end you must slay. It has, and this one, in, in, in almost all of your games, it ends, I won't say necessarily non-violently, but I think, the only, I think the only end boss that I can remember that ends with the brutal killing of an end boss is in Martian Dreams, where you jackhammer to death the end boss with an mm -hmm. M60 machine gun. Right. Yeah, and you chop him into pieces with it, and I think that's like the only end boss you kill violently. That's a very good point, and uh, uh, and you know maybe it comes out of the the fact that you know, maybe it's still part of my response to those earliest days where you know most every fantasy role playing game written has the following in super simple in my mind terrible plot. Mm -hmm. You're the hero because you're told so in the beginning. Your job is to kill that big boss henchman. Go kill. Him. The henchman waits for you to come kill him. Mm -hmm. Along the way, you pillage and plunder and min-max your way to the strength required to kill him. Ta-da, game's over. And I'm going like, man, there's just got to be a better game than that. There has to be a better story to tell than that. And so, uh, you know, while I don't think I really have anything specifically against boss monsters, uh, I don't really have much of an interest in them. It, it, mm -hmm. seems, it seems like, yeah, just become strong enough to kill a boss monster. Okay, that's interesting, but, you know, that's the same as every other yeah. story. And maybe that maybe that's because it's a tried and true and important part of the story. You could argue, yeah. but uh, but for me anyway, I've uh, I've not been compelled to follow that model. Well, and in, even in a lot of cases, you've got these you've got games where there's not even a villain, or not, where you might be the villain. Yeah. So like in Ultima four and five, you've got the Shadow Lords, but they're not even really. They're not, and you got Blackthorn, but there he's not even really the villain. He's yeah. he's. He's being he's duped. duped. He's duped. He's being duped. You know, um, the Shadow Lords are just kind of, they're, they're the ones duping him, but and ultimately, at the end, you just go to the bottom of the abyss, and Lord British is kind of hanging out in the pocket dimension, and he's just like, hey, did you bring my box? But as I, you know, but, but the way I look at it is, like, if you think about contemporary society right now, like, um, uh, it's probably better to avoid naming any politicians that you do or do not like, or at least I won't mention the ones I do or do not like, but there's some I like, and there's some I absolutely don't. Sure. And there's some that I think are incredibly misguided, and I think are doing incredible destruction to society. 
But I don't think they think they're doing damage to no. society. And I wouldn't exactly call them usually evil. No. And there's something somebody told me that uh, it was an author, I can't remember which author, it might have actually been um, Harlan Ellison, who said that uh, everybody's the hero of their own story. Right. Nobody thinks they're the villain. Right. Everyone thinks they're doing the right thing, unless right. they're insane. Right. Unless they're like, you know, I'm insane. Which, by the way, there are people that way. And so there really are people that you would you describe as evil. And what's interesting is, even though I think there's, it's, it's funny, I, I, I don't label people as evil lightly. No. But, you know, but I actually think, you know, there's a couple people in my business career that I look at and I've gone, okay, that person knows that what they're really doing is harmful. And they're doing it because they believe they can get away with it, and it's their business advantage. But there's no way they can think that it is fair mm -hmm. in a, you know, if you're a good person mm -hmm. with any reasonable interpretation of what fair is. And so we're like, okay, that person, you know, that, they've, they've started crossing this line into the dark side. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, business and profits occasionally drive people that way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that there are some people out there, I think, have, you know, have crossed that line. Yeah. Well, I, I just want the Ultima 8 cloth map to match the world in the game, like we did with all the other Ultimates. Why? Well, because if it doesn't match, then people won't be able to use the cloth map to guide them through gameplay in the game. Whatever, who cares? It's a map! Do you know how much it costs me to put these in each game? Two dollars! Why, why can't you make your game more like sports games? Because they ship on time every year. Because and then they just put the content in afterwards. Well, this is Ultima. You know, it's a role-playing game. You know, it requires the time. Role-playing game? What the hell is that? But th these games take a little longer. No, it doesn't matter. Just ship the game the way it is. Get out of my office. Okay, okay. okay. Frodo, okay. make the game on time when I say. So, I lost track of what we were talking about. Evilness. Right? Evilness. Bad Evilness. guys. Hey, do I do? 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 Hey,